Friends in Christ, it is my privilege to welcome you to this worship today on this Sunday of July 19th, 2020. I'm Pastor Del Keeney of the Mechanicsburg Church of the Brethren, and we are pleased for you to gather with us for this time of worship. I would take this opportunity to remind you that we will be gathering again for the first time as currently planned on September 13th. That will be the first gathering on site for our congregation's community. In the meantime, we plan to continue to share worship as we have here each week. We hope that you can join us throughout this time and that you will continue to practice safe and respectful practices as you care for those around you. We have been privileged today to be uh, gathered into worship through the strains of Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. We think about the words of that song challenging us to allow God to tune our hearts, to tune our hearts, to sing praise. This day, we will be guided to think about how it is that our hearts are drawn in many directions, but that God would seek for our hearts to be focused on him. This morning, as we enter our worship, I invite you to hear these words of the psalmist in Psalm 86, verses 11 through 17. These words are the words of a prayer, one seeking God's guidance, seeking God's movement in their lives. May it become our prayer this day as well. Hear these words of the psalmist. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, the insolent rise up against me. A band of ruffians seeks my life. And they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. Save the child of your serving girl. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. I invite you to continue in a time of prayer. Holy and gracious God, you who are slow to anger and abounding in mercy, we come this day seeking your Spirit's presence seeking you to work in our lives that you might grant us undivided hearts. Truly, we know that our hearts and our wills are splintered in many directions these days. But draw us again to you that we might sense your presence that we may be guided by your spirit, that the way of Jesus will be our way and we will walk in your path. 
We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, friends, I invite you to share in the hymn that will open our worship. Join us in the words and in the music, however you are led, as we are guided now. gospel reading for this morning continues our reading from the 13th chapter of Matthew's gospel. Today in our text we are offered another familiar parable of Jesus, but one not quite as familiar or child friendly as last week's story of the sower and the seeds. As with last week's parable, Matthew provides us both the story from Jesus and an inside look at its meaning as Matthew would provide it to us. Listen as I share the parable from verses 24 through 30 and then the interpretation in verses 36 through 43. He put before them another parable the kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go out and to gather them? But he replied, No. For in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. 
Later in the chapter, we find these verses. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the word of the Lord for us. Ponder the imagery and the meaning of this scripture as we reflect on the tune and the message of the interlude. Today we also continue our readings from the 8th chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Rome. I will be reading verses 12 through 25. Paul writes to this community, So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation 
was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord for us. Thanks be to God. Join me in prayer. Holy and merciful God, allow us now to reflect on your call for our lives, to reflect on your claim of us as your children, that we might have hearts that are wholly focused on you. Guide the words of the one who speaks and the hearts of those who listen, that your word might take root in us and transform us for your purposes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We began our worship hearing the words of the psalmist, praying that God would grant him an undivided heart. We, like the psalmist, would like our hearts to be unified in a world that is clear and simple, a world where we don't have to think so hard or work so hard to make sense at what is going on around us. There are those who would tell us that everything is simple. It's either right or wrong, black or white, good or evil, just choose the good, just get on the side of right and you'll be okay. But the world and even our own lives are far from simple. The complexities of what is going on out there can be overwhelming for us, but they are real. As we're inundated with information and so many perspectives on that information purported as fact. But though we are tempted to just fuss at the world for being more complicated than it ought to be, we understand that as we turn toward our own lives, our inward lives, that they are also complex. Yes, we can find ourselves tugged between the poles of good and evil. But in truth, there are shades of both at work in each one of us. To add to to the complexity, it's fair to say that some things are not evil in themselves, but prove to distract our attention from what is needed. You see, the chaos is not just out there in the world. It can be in here as well. As our lives get cluttered and confused with promises and hopes and fears. We agree with the psalmist's yearning. 
But we need to understand that the yearning for an undivided heart, a focused heart, a heart with one goal, is not satisfied by going back to what some of us consider are the old days. For we have simplified those old days only in our memories. Yes, they were simpler times. But then and now we're still faced with the tugs of what we believe will make our lives better or richer or easier or more satisfying. No, no less then as now, a prayer for a heart that is undivided. A heart with one goal expresses the yearning that we might move amidst the chaos toward the reality that God has created for us. That's where we yearn to be. In each of the scriptures for the morning, we gain some glimpses on our calling and of what it means to navigate such a path with such a heart. Paul, in his words to the church at Rome, offers us a perspective of where we find ourselves. And may no, make no mistake about it, life was no easier then than it is now for Christian believers. In many ways, it was more challenging in an environment when a challenge to the authority and the religion of the emperor was a recipe for a quick and inglorious end to one's life. But Paul looks at the chaos and he reframes it through Christ. The chaos is a sign of the times, that time and now. But as he sees it, as he reframes it, it is not a sign of destruction, but a sign of a coming birth. The birth of something new, which is of God. The message that he shares with his listeners, with those followers of Christ in Rome and all who've read those words since, is that they are a part of the new. We are a part of the new. Their groans at what is going on are joined by the creation itself in yearning and straining toward the new reality that God has promised that is to be birthed. But they are in the in-between. They are in the in-between, and so they find themselves living with hope. Hope that is guided by a heart centered on God's promises. That is the nature of a heart shaped by hope. It is a heart that deflects the distractions and centers its attention on God's movement. A heart that is guided by God's spirit. Trusting that in the end, God will complete and fulfill those purposes for creation and for humanity. That is Paul's testimony. As he reframes the chaos as the opportunity of God to make us and all of creation what God has intended it to be. But what about Jesus' parable? Where do we find ourselves there? If we take the retelling of the story, its explanation a little later in Matthew, we find it talking about an end time. That God will work it all out in the end. And that we should simply count on that. But as we listen to Jesus telling the parable. He really describes it, the kingdom of heaven, as that place in between. It is in between the planting of the seed and the seed planted by the enemy. 
in between that planting and the harvest that we find ourselves with the servants and slaves. We begin to see the heading of the plants. And now we know what starts to look like evil or good. And we want to fix it. We want to go right there. We want to go right there and tear it out. And we are sure that we know what needs to come out. But the master in his wisdom understands that there is more at stake than the weeds. What is at stake? Is the very fruit of the land that is desired, the wheat that he planted and yearned to grow. And so we hear the counsel given to those slaves, those servants. It is the counsel to leave the weeds where they are, to allow them to grow to fullness and maturity with the wheat. And then in time to allow both to be sorted out for their intended purposes. Now, I know that in the interpretation of the parable that Matthew gives, it speaks of the burning of, in the flame of fire, of destruction and judgment. But in the parable itself, all we hear is that the weeds are bundled for burning, and the grain is gathered. For saving, the weeds become kindling, not wasted, but finding a purpose in the master's household. While I would not disregard the interpretation we are given in Matthew, I would invite you to remember the focus, the center of the parable itself is not on the end and not on who will do the gathering. The focus is on the waiting and allowing in the midst of God's work for the possibility of growth still to happen. Now we know when it comes to weeds, they usually do not change their character. In this case, the tares, as the one version of scripture calls them, or darnel, as others describe it, is a weed that is sometimes called false wheat. It doesn't look any different until it finally bears its head of grain. And then the darnel has its head stand up while the wheat growing heavier with seed bends over. Then you see which bows and which will not. In the meantime, the counsel given is, I think, a fitting counsel for us in the midst of the chaos where we would be tempted to go out there and cut down the things which we are convinced are not of God. Indeed, we may be right. But it is God's manner and the manner of God's kingdom to invite us to be tenders of the soil and of lives and to resist the temptation to tear down and to destroy, to allow that work to be God's final work and our work to be hopeful, to be redemptive. Now, as Paul describes it, there are those who will be children 
of God. And those who will be children of the evil one. But our work is not to define who is who. But to invite all to be children of God. Friends, in these chaotic days, may our hearts be tuned not only to praise, but to the nature of that work, not divided by many things that call upon us, but focused on the work of Christ. To love, to extend grace, to feed and tend, even when we're not sure what is of God and what is of the evil one. May we continue to do Christ's work and to serve his kingdom with committed and unified hearts. May it be so. Let us pray. Gracious God, you who are full of mercy and compassion, you know our hearts. You know the chaos within us and how we struggle with the good and evil in us. We are a reflection of the world. But we are a key place where you do your work in each life and in our life together. And so may we open our hearts for your spirit to move, to nudge, to clarify, to bring us unity in spirit and in action. Forgive us where we are quick to judge and unwilling to allow your kingdom to grow in its fullness when we look at the groans of the world as groans of destruction and miss the opportunity to see them with hope as the groaning of your creation to be made whole in you. O oh God, continue to guide our hearts and thus our lives that in the chaos around us and in the chaos within us, we might center ourselves on you as our one goal with undivided hearts. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As you have heard the words of challenge, I invite you now to join in the singing of our hymn of response, number 356 in our Church of the Brethren hymnal. Breathe on me, breath of God. May it be your prayer and mine this day. Let us sing or reflect on the words and the music together.
so shall I never die, but live with thee the perfect life of thine eternity. Friends in Christ, as the breath of God breathes into our lives. May we be strengthened and encouraged. May we find our hearts made pure so that we can deal with the chaos around us and the chaos within with a focus on the love of God to us shown through Jesus Christ. That we may remember our place as God's children and that we may be witnesses to his love in the in-between, between the planting and the harvest. As we treat with grace and mercy, wheat and weeds, knowing that God has the power to transform us and all he loves. May you go in his peace and serve the Lord. Amen.